Over the past century, mankind has experienced an unprecedented increase in life expectancy and quality of life. Medical breakthroughs and research have played a huge role in these huge increases, and few medical developments have had as great an impact as antibiotics. First developed in the late 30s and early 40s, modern antibiotics have saved the lives of over 200 million people to date, with countless millions more helped in some fashion. While the most famous of these early antibiotics is of course penicillin, it was but one of the first antibiotics out there, and used mostly in the West. The nascent Soviet sphere was without this new wonder drug, but would quickly develop their own, one which proved similarly and incredibly effective, Gramacid and S. Before diving into Gramacid and S, or GS for sake of syllables, it's worth looking at the circumstances that led to its development, namely the massive world war going on. World War II was an absolute meat grinder on all fronts and for all sides. If you weren't getting run over by tank treads or vaporized by artillery, a wound suffered in battle was just as deadly. The muck, grime, and unforgiving weather of a war-torn Europe was less than sanitary. The bacterial infection of wounds was a major killer. There were few effective treatments for gangrene and other such diseases during World War I, and this contributed to massive casualty numbers during that conflict. With another world war underway, there would surely be similar conditions and similar casualties, and thus there was a major need for some true antibiotic. Fortunately, progress had been made in this area during the interwar period. You had sulfa-based drugs as one of the first general antibiotics by the late 1930s, and by 1939 you had tyrothrosin, a topical antibiotic. Unfortunately, these early antibiotics had certain limitations. Sulfa drugs were inhibited in the presence of pus, making them less effective in already infected wounds. Tyrothrosin could be used to treat infections, but was otherwise a relatively low-strength antibiotic and difficult to isolate and actually utilize. In light of this, both the Western allies and the Soviet Union would doggedly pursue new treatments and better antibiotics at the onset of war. The Western allies would quickly settle on penicillin, an antibiotic first discovered in 1929, but only pursued as a medical treatment starting in 1940. The Soviets didn't have access to their research, however, at least at the start of the war, and would have to pursue their own studies in manufacturing regarding antibiotics. The Soviets would quickly see success in their own antibiotic development, however, thanks in large part to one Georgi Gauza. Gauza was a Russian ecologist and early evolutionary biologist operating out of Moscow, the heart of Soviet science. His research was primarily regarding competition and proliferation between different species, but when World War II began in 1939, he moved into national defense work for the Soviet Union. He soon came to know the Minister of Public Health, Pyotr Sergeyev, and suggested the formation of an antibiotics laboratory within the ministry. Sergeyev obliged, and in 1940, a dedicated antibiotics division was established with Gauza at its head. The lab's research was informed and given direction by the very recent discovery of tyrothrosin, an antibiotic treatment derived from the bacterium Bacillus brevis. There was potential and interest in bacteria that could themselves produce antibiotics, and Gauss's lab would quite literally go around digging up bacteria for analysis. The team would have a major breakthrough in the summer of 1942, where after digging through gardens in suburban Moscow, they came across a bacteria sample with significant antibiotic properties. After analysis, they learned it was a unique strain of Bacillus brevis, and dubbed it Bacillus brevis variant GB, short for Gauza Brajnikova. The Brajnikova came from the other head of the antibiotics lab, Maria Brajnikova, a doctor of chemistry, and also Gauza's wife. They cultivated sizable cultures of the bacteria at hand, isolated the target antibiotic compound, and dubbed it Gramacid and S. The S stands for Soviet, and was appended to distinguish it from a similar compound found in tyrothrosin, Gramacidin D. Gramacidin S was similar to tyrothrosin, being a topical antibiotic, but possessed numerous desirable qualities compared to it. It was not only easier to isolate than tyrothrosin, but had about four times its antibacterial strength as well. Furthermore, it was easier to produce, evinced by the Soviet Union's rapid rollout of the drug. Within six months of its discovery, GS was being produced in significant quantities for military hospitals in the Soviet Union. As a topical antibiotic, GS was incredibly effective in treating infected wounds, along with sterilizing fresh wounds, thus preventing future infection. For the poorly equipped Soviets, whose casualty numbers were through the roof, GS proved invaluable for treating injured Soviet soldiers. Now, despite Gramacid and S's incredible effects, it wasn't perfect with its primary drawback being the fact it was only a topical antibiotic. 
treatment of internal infections cannot be done with gramicidin S, as its mechanism of action is somewhat indiscriminate. GS works by interfering with the membranes of cells by ingraining itself within them. It essentially pokes a hole in a cell's wall or its organelles, ruining any concentration gradient between the inside and outside. This prevents proper cell function and replication, and ultimately leads to cell death. While this affects bacterial cells, the intended target, it also targets human blood cells. This means oral administration of GS was out of the question. It would ruin your blood before actually fighting an infection. While this was a definite drawback compared to something like penicillin, GS was nonetheless highly effective in its role, and interestingly got into Soviet military hospitals before penicillin arrived in Western ones. Gramosin and S would be used throughout World War II on the Soviet side, and would quickly see production for domestic consumption as well, saving countless lives both at home and on the battlefield. GS would also reach the rest of the world in 1944, when Gauza and his wife met with the Western developers of penicillin, the Oxford Group. The two teams swapped research data along with samples of their particular microbe of study, which helped jumpstart the Soviet Union's development of penicillin. To that end, GS would continue serving as the primary antibiotic in the Soviet Union throughout the 1940s, before eventually getting phased out with penicillin and related drugs starting in the 1950s. While Gramosidin S was only heavily utilized for a few years, its development was still of incredible importance, and all the more impressive given the Soviet political climate of the time. You see, Joseph Stalin wasn't a very nice guy. To anyone, really. The USSR under his rule was particularly repressive and overbearing, with the Soviet scientific community frequently experiencing purges and oppression. One of the leading figures in this oppression was one Trofim Lysenko, director of the Institute of Genetics for the Soviet Union. His position there was obtained primarily due to political proselytizing and good relations with Stalin, not any actual scientific acumen. In fact, Lysenko was a pseudoscientist at best, and a politically possessed lunatic at worst. His entire scientific theory was built off feverish interpretations and bizarre agglomerations of largely disproven theories regarding inheritance, genetics, and ecology. Within his theories was a total rejection of genetics as a concept, supremely ironic given the institution he would head. In spite of his unfitness for any scientific position, he dogmatically pushed his theories on the Soviet citizenry, and often to catastrophic results. Perhaps the most damaging theory of what is now dubbed Lysenkoism was his Law of the Life of Species. Lysenko believed plants of the same species were mutually cooperative, that they were of the same class and never competed with each other. Lysenko held major sway regarding agriculture in the Soviet Union, and as per his stupid theory, required farmers to plant seeds as close together as possible. Because plants are indeed competitive for resources, this led to major crop failures, massive famines, and millions dead from starvation. In spite of his ascientific theories and the consequences thereof, dissent against them and Lysenko from actual scientists was severely punished. Under this Lysenkoist thought regime, which spanned the 30s into the 60s, over 3,000 biologists, geneticists, and scientists had their careers ruined, if they weren't purged, of course. It was, frankly, a horrible time for the sciences. But not all was lost. For scientists whose work was simply too critical to operate under the falsities of Lysenkoism, exceptions were made, and Georgi Gauza was one such exception. While Gauza had discovered and characterized Bacillus brevis GB, developing strains that could generate large quantities of gramicidin S was vital for the production of the antibiotic. To do so, samples of bacteria would be exposed to ionizing radiation in order to induce mutations that would increase their natural production of GS. This process required the acknowledgement of basic genetics and the existence of mutations, two realities denied by Lysenkoism. Fortunately, the importance of scaling up GS development meant Gauss and his team could utilize the actual science, and in turn, deliver results related to gramicidin S. Gauss would continue to have free scientific reign throughout Lysenkoism, ultimately developing numerous antibiotic and anti-cancer treatments, and even earning the state prize of the USSR for his work. The good fortune of working on something so critical spared Gauza and his wife, and in turn, gave the Soviet Union and medical community this groundbreaking drug. Gramosidin S in the modern era is now largely obsolete. It never had internal applications, and has thus fallen out of favor compared to more full-spectrum antibiotics. It does still have certain uses, however. It can still treat topical infections, though those are increasingly uncommon in modern countries with modern medicine. Gramosidin S also has contraceptive uses. Sperm cells are just as susceptible to GS as their blood and bacterial counterparts. 
All in all, while Gramercy and S may be a relic from the early years of the Soviet Union, it was nonetheless a vital and groundbreaking drug for the country, and came at a time when it was desperately needed. Hey, thanks for reaching the end, and I hope you enjoy this vid. Gramercy and S and the history surrounding it is a really interesting topic, and one I came across coincidentally while working on a video for a different channel, which you should definitely check out. Hey, I'm That Chemist, and I run a science education channel looking primarily at, you guessed it, chemistry. Me and Siggy just put out a tier list looking at various antibiotics, their structure, their effects, and of course ranking them. It's an interesting look at the modern antibiotics we all rely on, and something worth checking out if you enjoyed this video. Yeah, totally check out TC's vid. I had a lot of fun working on and researching it, and it's just a really fascinating topic in my opinion. With that out of the way, feel free to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel, and until next time, take care.